I want to announce the first speaker, uh, who is Yiji Horak, and he will tell us about linear algebra and nonlinear uh, discourse seismology. This will be a 35 minute talk. Uh, I will give you some warning when mm -hmm. the time is finishing. So now please, Yiji, share your screen with us and uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Oh, do you see? And can you hear me? Yes. yes. Uh -huh, perfect. Thank you very much. So I'm also would like to uh, wish happy birthday to Zdenek and uh, thank you for establishing this very nice uh, rec time meeting. And uh, I will talk about uh, something what I did during the first wave of epidemia. And then I happily forgot about that, but since now the second wave is approaching or it's already here, so I kind of uh, recover all my notes and uh, put it in this presentation. So uh, this is a outline. I don't know why there is this uh, green thing around. You see it as well, probably. Okay. So. Um, here is the outline and uh, I will talk, start with something kind of very old and maybe even well known for some of us. And uh, it will be like about simple oscillators with some nonlinearity. So I will discuss effects of these nonlinearities and uh, touch also some mathematical difficulties which they uh, cause. And then I go to oscillations of fluids and start with some classical approach to nonlinear oscillations of fluid, mostly developed in context of stellar polarization theory. And uh, it will be just brief review. And after that, uh, new things start. So I would try to introduce kind of new way of uh, calculating nonlinear oscillations of fluids in general. And then I hope that there will be still some time. I will talk about uh, some application of this approach to nonlinear discourse seismology. And in particular, as an example, I will discuss nonlinear evolution of the trapped mode, uh, G mode, which uh, lives inside the disk close to its inner edge. And uh, there is some interesting result that this nonlinear uh, coupling between all kind of perturbations of this can even lead to excitation of two pair of outgoing waves which are in three to two ratio. So this is the kind of highlight and uh, of course it wouldn't be um, good track time if there is no new uh, model of QP of presented. And then I hope that I will even go to discussion and some conclusion. So let me start with simple oscillators. And at the beginning, uh, we have kind of very general and very frequent in physics equation, which is just like a Newton equation of motion, where you have some force which is acting on some body. And uh, we describe the location of this body from the equilibrium by this y, then we have this simple equation. And of course, a lot of physical situations look like that. And then, of course, what people are doing is that they expand this F in terms of uh, Taylor expansion in this Y. And uh, they see that, uh, of course, the zero all the time is zero, it's by definition it's equilibrium position. But then there are other terms in this Taylor expansion, and the first order term already provide some important information about the oscillation. Namely, it is uh, somehow related to the oscillation frequency, which you will then observe. And then there are all, all other higher order terms, and uh, this will be subject of this talk, actually. So I will talk mostly about oscillators with quadratic nonlinearity. So it means that I will cut this Taylor expansion just after, after the second order term. So if you take this and substitute here, 
we'll find dine found out uh, like something what looks like simple harmonic oscillator and on the right hand side there is a quadratic nonlinearity. This equation is difficult to solve in general. So what people are doing is that they are assuming that these oscillations are small, not completely small as usually when the right hand side is missing but uh, kind of small. And uh, this is done in such a way that you assume that this y is actually small quantity. So introduce, you introduce like this formal expansion parameter epsilon, which is much less than one. And then you kind of look for the solution in terms of the of some power series of this epsilon, where all these coefficients, one, two, three, are actually functions of time. So if you take it and substitute to this uh, governing equation, you will find out uh, a lot of equations, right? In each order, you have different equations. I will not go too much through it, but what is important is that, first of all, in each order, you have linear equation. And uh, what is changing is only right-hand side. This is nice if you kind of uh, are fluent if in method of variation of parameters, then you can easily solve it. And then on the other, on the right hand side, there are just kind of some terms. But what is nice about it is that all these terms on the right hand side, you already know from the solution of the previous order. So you can go really order by order and kind of uh, evaluate all these approximations which I then done here, like up to the third order in this epsilon, and I've got this kind of solution, which is here on the bottom of this slide. Now, if you look how this solution looks like, you will find out that it looks like this. So in black is kind of linear solution, which is perfectly bounded and uh, looks like harmonic oscillator, as all of us know it. But then uh, on the, in the blue line, it is uh, the solution, like complete solution up to the third order. And what we found out that this solution is somehow di diverging. And the question is, is this divergence real or no? And if it is real, then it means that we discovered some new instability, but in such a general case, it would mean that all the oscillations in the universe would be finally unstable. So uh, let's, let's look at that in kind of more details. So the question, can the oscillation or can the solution be bounded or unbounded uh, can be actually answered very simply. You just take your equation like in this form. So this integrand should be zero. And uh, you multiply it by the velocity, which is y dot and you just integrate it right so the right hand side where there was zero integrates to some constant and the left left hand side this integral is easily evaluated to this and for in this expression you see kind of uh, already very now terms like the, for example the first term one half of the uh, square of the velocity is probably somehow related to kinetic energy. And then there is the rest, which is depending only on the position. So it will be probably something like potential energy or potential in general. And so this constant of integration would be probably total energy of the oscillation. Fine, whatever it is, it is obvious that uh, if you put or you demand that this y dot is zero, which is happening actually at its turning point of this oscillation, you will find out that this is zero only when this potential is equal to the energy of the oscillation. And both of them are not changing, right? Potential is all the time the same, it depends on the oscillation. Energy is all the time the same, we just derived that it's conserved. So obviously this turning point should be all the time at the same position. This is kind of shown in this picture. 
So we know that for sure that this oscillation should be bounded and probably something weird is happening with uh, our solution obtained uh, like in the previous slide. So what is wrong? If you kind of look more closely to this solution, which I am doing here, there is just kind of initial part of this uh, picture, which was uh, in previous slide. And I added also numerical solution of this solution, which is kind of easier to get. Then you find out that actually this true oscillation represented here by this numerical solution have kind of different frequency than this linear oscillator. And uh, obviously what is happening is that this kind of uh, difference is tried to be compensated by this higher order term. So you can see here that actually, actually this higher order approximations are do going, uh, doing quite well, but because of course this uh, frequency dif difference becomes more and more apparent, they must kind of be stronger and stronger to adjust this frequency to the real frequency. And as a side effect, they must grow. And of course, you can see it in this growing of the amplitude. OK, how to solve it, right? You can include more terms in the expansion. But then you will find out that the situation is even worse. Because if you add like fourth order term or five order term, uh, you will discover that uh, these guys, of course, also want to involve themselves and help the situation. But somehow the amplitude grows even faster. So we are really blowing up very quickly. And you can you would conclude that actually all this expansion breaks at time, which is given by this simple formula. At this time, all the terms in the expansion are of the same amplitude. So you should in principle include like infinite number of terms, which is Kind of difficult to do even if you are fluent in solving uh, original differential equation. So obviously we have to do something about that. Now the question is where exactly this secular terms or this grow comes out. And if you inspect like uh, the solution which we derived at the beginning, you will see that actually they comes out from this t times uh, the harmonic function. So this T here is the cause of this growth. This growth is really linear. So if you trace the origin of this term back, you will find out that it's here, of course, the third order approximation is doing that. And uh, there it appears because you are forcing the oscillator in the third order with the same frequency as is the natural frequency of the oscillator. And of course, it, ne it leads to the resonance. So actually, this term is causing the trouble. So what to do with uh, how to kind of arrive to uniformly valid expansion or some kind of consistent expansion? There are several ways how to uh, kind of go around this obstacle and uh, they are very old. So I think the most kind of uh, natural and uh, method is to use kind of more general expansion to give this expansion more freedom and then take this freedom back by imposing some constraint, like for example, that the secular growth will not, will not appear. So the very, very old method is uh, invented by Poincaré and Lipset. These are these two gentlemen here in the picture. And they actually uh, introduce like new scale or a new time, this tau, which is somehow related to this uh, physical time. And uh, they are related like uh, some constant time, this t, but this constant is still kind of undetermined. You can expand it in, uh, in epsilon, and then in each order, 
you will have to solve also, or you will have to decide it what this uh, omega is, and you can adjust this omega in such a way that it will kill this secular term, so this forcing term with the same frequency as with the oscillator. There is another method introduced by Alan Isaac, which is this third gentleman here, and um, it is called uh, method of multiple time scale. And uh, basically, it follows the very same idea as Poincaré and Winstead, uh, but uh, it is doing like uh, technically it's a little bit different. They are not introducing like expansion, uh, like unknown time, which they would kind of uh, more this uh, this uh, transformation they will make more and more precise. But they are instead introducing several time scales. And uh, the advantage of this approach is that actually uh, here you have algebraic uh, relationship, here, here you have kind of differential relationship. And therefore, you can solve much more problems using this approach. It is just kind of technical difference that this method is kind of more powerful for more problems. So how, how it works, it's shown here. So I, here I am solving, uh, solving exactly the same equation like at the beginning, but instead of time, I introduce several time scales which are related to this physical time by uh, some power of epsilon, right? So T zero is just physical time. T one is just epsilon time, time, times time. So it goes much more slower T square is at some square and so on. And uh, you just assume that the solution depends on all of them and do expansion like before. Of course, you have to expand all the derivatives, which looks like this, right? It's the total derivative, the partial derivative. And then you substitute to your governing equation and see what, what happens, how the solution looks order by order. So the linear order is absolutely the same, but the trick is now that this constant uh, integration constant, which were really constant in the previous case, now depends also on these other time scales, right? Because this is partial differential equation and it fixed only dependence on this kind of zero order time scale, but of course this A could depend also on higher order time scale. So it's here. And uh, if you take it and substitute to uh, the here, uh, then you see that uh, you arrive to equation which looks like this. And there is one term in addition, which is this one which comes actually from the expansion of derivatives applying to this constant. So actually, this is the main point that these constants are depending also on a higher time scale. And uh, of course, this term would normally kind of uh, produce this secular term because it's oscillating at the same frequency as the oscillator. But you can easily kill it by requiring that this A simply doesn't depend on the first time scale. So you have something like this, you will go to the third order and again, you, you are getting something like this. And this is kind of the regular secular term, which cause all the troubles. But here you see the advantage of this method because although this method produced another term, which uh, oscillates with the natural frequency of the oscillator. So you can easily demand that A depends somehow on this second order time scale in a way that it will cancel effect of this term. So from this, I have kind of equation from the amplitude, how it depends on the second time scale. So this is kind of very, um, very nice approach to this perturbation. And uh, of course you can even solve this equation. So at the end, you end up with, uh, solution which looks like this. So there are some several terms and uh, the main linear oscillation is just this term. Then there are some uh, first order terms which are quadratic in the amplitude. And uh, one is even don't 
changing in time. It's kind of steady state shift from the uh, uh, equilibrium position. And then uh, there is the second harmonic and the third harmonic. Appearance of harmonics is typical, uh, is typical kind of suggestion that uh, this process, uh, this oscillatory process is probably not linear. And uh, this theta is now not changing with the nature of frequency, but it's now changing with the frequency which is little bit kind of corrected by this delta, F, uh, delta omega, which follows from exactly the solvability condition which was imposed like in the third order. If I plot it, I get beautiful solution that uh, this multiple scale uh, expansion perfectly follows the numerical solution. Uh, here it's clear that it's not, not uh, there are already some differences, but it is because I, uh, I put quite a strong nonlinearity. This epsilon sum times alpha was one half, which is quite kind of strong. But you see that uh, otherwise it, will, it works quite well. <clears throat> so this was the method of multiple scale, but uh, there is one kind of trivial but important slide, uh, which is kind of trivial observation, right? So if we are typically arriving in this uh, in this problem that we have some oscillator on the left hand side it can be arbitrary kind of equation in arbitrary or in, in arbitrary order and on the right hand side we have this uh, oscillatory term which is oscillating with some frequency which could be different from this omega zero then you can impose the ansatz like this of course which is clever and uh, if you plug it here you will find out that uh, what you have to solve is algebraic equation. And now what is kind of uh, important observation, although it is very trivial here, is this. There can be two options. Either this omega is oscillating with this, uh, this uh, right hand side is oscillating with the same frequency as omega zero. And then you will get here zero. And you will find out that this equation doesn't have solution. But on the other hand, if there is no right hand side, you will find out that this equation has infinite number of solutions. Right? Or there is the other case where this omega is not equal to omega zero. And then you will find out you can easily solve this equation, you will get this result. Uh, and, but at the same time, if F would be equal to zero, you will get just trivial solution A is equal to zero. So there are these two, two, uh, two options or two things may happen. Either the homogeneous equation has non-trivial solution and then inhomogeneous equation doesn't have any solution and is not solvable or the uh, or the homogeneous equation uh, doesn't have solution it has only trivial solution and then inhomogeneous equation is solvable this will be important like in few minutes and now i'm moving to oscillations of fluid so in the case of fluids, we have a uh, little bit different equation, which we have to uh, satisfy. They are partial differential equation in time and space. And uh, here I am, I am just having equation for the, for the perfect fluid. So there's no viscosity, nothing. And basically what, what you have to satisfy is mass conservation, which looks like continuity equation and uh, momentum conservation, which looks like Euler equation. So these are these two equations. And then there is algebraic equation of state. It may not be algebraic, no. but this one is algebraic. Uh, and uh, which are telling us how the gas reacts to, uh, to be like pressured. So they are connecting like uh, pressure and density. 
and there, there could be also temperature, but now I'm assuming that the dependence on temperature uh, is not important, that uh, the equation of state is one parameter. And even I'm solving even, considering even more easiest, even more easy case, which is isothermal equation of state, which is kind of, which is easiest uh, one can imagine and which is just that the pressure is proportional to density and the constant of proportionality is speed of sound, which is constant everywhere. So, one assume that there exists some stationary solution of this equation, which is kind of uh, natural because of course, if we are talking about oscillations, we need to have to oscillate about something. And uh, so we assume that there is a stationary configuration. And this stationary configuration is basically described by this zero here, right? So everything with zero is related to stationary configuration. And then we make like small, not necessarily very small, but some perturbation of this, of this stationary configuration. So we, we, kind of introduce some deviations and these deviations are um, basically denoted by this prime about that. So prime means, uh, uh, prime means uh, perturbation, zero means stationary. And uh, so if we take this and substitute to our equation, we will get equation for this perturbation, which looks like this. And here I even kind of simplify the situation uh, using introducing the relative, uh, introducing the enthalpy because it has kind of beautiful, beautiful relation, uh, which kind of simplified the, the, the equation. So the perturbation have just four, four variables, right? Perturbation of enthalpy and perturbation of velocity. Variables. Now, somebody, uh, okay, I see. Uh, this is kind of interactive slide because uh, these online talks are usually without any interaction. So now I'm asking myself uh, this question, and maybe somebody of you can also think about that as well. So the question is how it can be? Oscillators are described by the second order ordinary differential equations in time but we have the first order partial differential equation in time. So how we know that it describes the oscillation? To which I answer that even the oscillator can be described by the first order ordinary differential equation. And this is kind of shown here. That if you take the simple harmonic oscillator equation, which looks like this and introduce kind of this little bit strange uh, change of the variables, then you can rewrite it actually in the form of first order differential equation. So harmonic oscillator doesn't necessarily mean second derivative in time. And uh, this is actually the case. Standard approach. Standard approach to kind of nonlinear oscillations in fluid used in stellar polarization theory is uh, based on slightly different formalism. They are not introducing Eulerian perturbations, which are these prime quantities, but they are introducing something what is called Lagrangian perturbations, which are basically like perturbation as viewed from the, from the system, which is correlating with the fluid in the stationary configuration. So they are introducing this Eulerian perturbation and uh, advantage of this is that uh, you can write perturbation of any quantity in terms of something, some vector psi, which is called Lagrangian, dis Lagrangian displacement. And uh, basically it connects like uh, the given fluid element between the, his position in the equilibrium to his position in the perturbed state. So introducing this is a little bit kind of advanced. You see that uh, there is some total derivative with respect to time, but the perturbation of density is even more complicated. There is some Jacobian involved here. 
but uh, you can do it and there is nice theory about that and if you pardon, if you substitute this to your governing equation you will find out that uh, the equation the, the continuity equation kind of is satisfied trivially and the Euler equation gives you just this equation which looks like uh, like this and uh, so the kind of this uh, on the left hand side there are terms which are linear in the xi uh, on the right hand side there are non-linear terms in xi here this is the second order but this theory is producing uh, non-linearities of all kinds of order and uh, what is nice about that that if you have purely rotating bodies and you introduce color product on the space of all kind of displacements uh, in the body, you will find out that this operator is anti-Hermitian and this operator is Hermitian. More or less, if you have static configuration, there is no motion in you know, a stationary case, this V goes to zero and you end up with single, like, single equation which after kind of normal mode ANSA uh, translates to single simple eigenvalue problem. Now because you know that this C is Hermitian then you immediately know that the spectrum of this operator is such that uh, all eigen, eigen values, this omega square are real numbers and this is not uh, but more importantly, you know also that all these eigenfunctions are orthogonal with respect to this color product and makes the complete set. And uh, this is very helpful because then you can write the solution of the nonlinear equations. Like you can expand it simply to this basis found in the linear order, which is done here. And if you substitute this expansion to this equation, project it to different kind of eigenfunctions, you will end up with kind of series of harmonic oscillators, which are coupled, uh, which are coupled by the by some polynomial right hand side. This is kind of very nice method, and. Uh, there, it has also a lot of advantages, but it has also some disadvantages. So, first, the advantages. Nonlinear oscillations of static bodies are transformed to series of coupled nonlinear oscillators. So, we kind of change the problem from difficult to a lot of small problems, but we know how to solve. Then, of course, you can uh, use the same perturbative method and, as in the case of the simple oscillator. Uh, like this multiple scales, which is tried forward with the same equations, but there are a lot of them. And you will get kind of a nice solution. So this is the big advantage. There are some kind of disadvantages as well. For example, the Lagrangian description is kind of less intuitive. No? You have all the information about perturbation in this Lagrangian displacement, and if you want, to go back to kind of real physical quantities, then you have to make all these calculations again and calculate like from Lagrangian displacement, uh, um, displacement the Eulerian, uh, Eulerian perturbations. The other trouble is that actually not all the not all the stationary configurations are really static, and for example, in rotating bodies like rotating stars this theory becomes much more complicated because of presence of Coriolis force. And uh, actually what is happening that already in linear order, you deal with quadratic eigenvalue problem. And uh, this beautiful uh, theorem of the completeness of eigenfunctions kind of goes away. And uh, there, is, there are still some method how to kind of fix it uh, you have to expand not in the configuration space, but in the phase space. And at the end, uh, 
what you are having is kind of linear eigenvalue problem, but uh, with the matrix, which is kind of not Hermitian at all. And uh, therefore there are these Jordan chains and you have to kind of use also this associated vector from these chains to make really complete set. But it's doable, it's doable, it's very sophisticated quite complicated and this theory was basically introduced by Dizon and Schutz. They have, they, this is the important work in this, uh, in this theory showing how to make this complete set, which is the essence of this method. And recently it was reviewed by Sheng and this review, they are really kind of going to the point, uh, but still it has like 80 pages. But it's beautiful reading and uh, kind of very sophisticated method and nice. Then there is another disadvantage, which uh, I think is kind of serious for accretion disks uh, or constructing disk seismology. And that is that actually that these expansions to eigenmodes may not be always very practical because it may happen that, for example, one mod is coupled to a lot of other mods. And uh, you may be start the calculation just with a single mod, but already in the second order, you have kind of full net of all mods to which this full mod is kind of coupled. So it could be also very kind of demanding and difficult to really follow this way. So the question is, we do every, all these kind of things just because we need completeness of the eigenmod or to have some basis in this Hilbert space of all possibility spaces. So would it be possible to take different way? And uh, is this completeness really so necessary? And here there is that maybe we can use another approach. So this is just the uh, reminding you that we are we want to solve these two coupled nonlinear partial differential equations. So one can actually rewrite this equation in a little bit different form, like introducing this vector w. It's just kind of rewrite, uh, which is just four components or two components, but one component is vector. And uh, then if you do this, uh, you, rewrite, you arrive to this kind of not much simpler because you are just rewriting, but looks quite nicer uh, equation, which looks like this. So th this term is basically this term. This term is basically this rest of the left hand side, which is linear in perturbation. And on the right hand side, there are this nonlinear term, which I wrote using uh, as a bilinear form. This is just kind of aesthetics and it's, uh, it's good because the working with this is easier, but kind of it's not necessary. And then, so what would happen if we try to solve this equation just like straightforward using multiple scales, but nothing else? So then I will write this uh, solution from uh, the time dependence. I go to the dependence of multiple scales. So again, I have this right forward expansion where the variables depend on other time scale as well. Because I have first order uh, differential equation in time, my expansion of derivatives is even simpler than, more simple than before. And uh, in the linear order, I am having just this equation. And of course, it looks like a general problem. If you substitute this ansatz, then you will really arrive to eigenvalue problem. This L is not Hermitian, but uh, what can we do? And uh, you will find some, definitely not complete set, but some kind of set of modes which looks like this, and they are labeled by this L. Um, this is actually done, or this has been done a lot of time before, like there are a lot of papers about linear perturbations of anything almost. So basically this step is done by a lot of people for different systems. 
now uh, I will write just linear solution as a combination of uh, of one of the more and it's kind of complex conjugated more uh, because I want the complete solution to be then linear uh, to be real and this a and this a depends also on higher or the time scale right now, if I plug it to the second order equations, I will arrive to something like this. So again, the left hand side is the same. On the right hand side, there are some forcing terms which is which are arising either from multiple scales. This is this term, or from the second order expansion from this quadratic nonlinearity. So it's, uh, I use this notation just kind of make make equation nicer and uh, like schematically you can uh, you can uh, you can take because it's linear every term like uh, separately so basically you are all the time solving this kind of equation is b is nothing else but this kind of linear operator here so we are we are solving equation some operator on some function which is n now is equal to some right hand side which is now so it's a little bit similar to the situation uh, like mentioned on this uh, trivial but important slide and the point is that although this equation may or may not be solvable so when it is definitely when it is definitely solvable it is solvable when this operator b is kind of one to one projection which means that every, of course, every, uh, this operator kind of uh, projects every point from this uh, this space to the other space, but also for every kind of image, you will find some source. You have two minutes. Two? Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and uh, so, uh, okay. Two minutes is over time. So, okay, so it's maybe a or may not be solvable, and you have uh, you can find some kind of very clever way how to decide if it is solvable or if it is not solvable, and then you can continue all the way the same way as in the case of this oscillator further and further, and uh, basically you can construct easily the nonlinear theory just based on this uh, solvability condition of the oscillator. You have to involve only some adjoint space to this eigenfunction. So you can go to the third order as I did like last time. And uh, the question is about nonlinear discourse cosmology. So uh, here I just review uh, all kind of modes we have. So we have either G modes which are living behind below the uh, below the maximum of epicyclic frequency so they are self-trapped or they are trapped just by the relativistic effect and then there are p modes which are kind of living outside this barrier and this uh, g mod which lives in this cavity can actually by tunneling go through this potential barrier to the place where the its frequency match the vertical frequency and then it propagates freely to infinity as a p wave and the question is how this g mod evolve in time so i have one specific g mod right here and uh, so this is like solution of the uh, fluid disk equation and this this is just one eigenvalue of the uh, eigen solution of this linear problem. So we have the G mod trapped here. Some portion goes uh, penetrate this potential barrier and leads to infinity as an outgoing P wave. So it's here visible. So it lives here. Here it is evanescent, and here the wave the domain appears. And the question is how uh, how how this uh, mod evolves kind of in nonlinear uh, manner and what we found actually that in second order it 
uh, in higher order, it excites several kind of other, it's not modes, it's kind of responses of the disk uh, that can be wavy. So for example, this one's stationary and this is not wavy, but this one is actually quite interesting that uh, this uh, G mode is coupled with each other and creating like either P wave here and equal to or another P wave here, which is an equal zero. And if you look at it, uh, look at the amplitude of these uh, of these uh, waves, they are quite serious. So actually this P mod is, uh, G mod is quite seriously coupled to this P wave. And they are probably leading to nonlinear dumping of this G mod because they are uh, dragging the energy from the G mod like to infinity. And if you go to third order, you will find out that actually even the third, uh, like the three of these G mod arcs may excite some perturbation, uh, which is also, which has an equal one, and uh, they are dragging also a lot of energy. So actually this G mod is exciting two other modes or two other waves in the disk. One is having like frequency two omega uh, of the G mod and the other one is having three omega of the G mod. And so this is like, I am not saying model of QPOs, but uh, kind of uh, quite interesting. So thank you very much. I'm sorry for uh, going out of my time. Uh, thank you, Izzy. It's okay. I mean, we started a little bit later because of the photo, so I just...